welcome to the ghost show online by fiends, booze, and ghouls. <laughs> Your hosts, Seeker Groves, Rachel Benjamin, and Ian Russell will discuss all things paranormal. Prepare to be afraid. 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 Everybody, welcome to the Ghost Show. Uh, today, it's just Ian and I because Rachel's unfortunately not available. But we're going to do our show today on superstitions or superstitions. <laughs> do you believe? Do you not believe? How do you feel about that, Ian? Uh, yeah. Well, um, I can only speak for myself. And um, I myself am not superstitious uh, whatsoever, um, but I know that there are a lot of people out there who are, and right. some of these superstitions date back to, oh my God, forever. That, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, that yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, superstitions go back pretty much as far as recorded history, and certainly predate recorded history, I would suspect, to the best of our knowledge, because as humans, we've always had these things that we don't understand. And in order to make sense of them or things that we fear, we try to create some sort of logical explanation or some sort of reason to not you know, do those things or observe certain days or numbers. And it's interesting because they seem to be random when I say that. I'm, I mean, if you look at a lot of the history of superstitions, every country seems to have their own very particular superstitions around certain things. And then we have individual concepts of superstition, of course, we have uh, superstition related to religion. We have superstition related to natural occurrences, such as solar eclipse or lunar eclipse. We also have natural phenomena, you know, anything like that, that people can't understand or don't know how to explain. And then we have superstition around events. And then Great. we have yeah. Yeah. And then we have superstitions that touch on various types of work or jobs or applications thereof. So I think today we're going to try and touch on a number of these different superstitions. And I know, Ian, like you said, you don't really believe at all. And I'm not highly superstitious myself. So now one thing that I, I do sort of take note of is I do a lot of work in theater and I'm on stage and I do you know a lot of writing of shows producing and etc so there are a lot of superstitions surrounding theater and I, I want to talk about those today and okay. then I know uh, that you were gonna you're gonna sort of tell us a little bit about a number of just general superstitions so so why don't we just kind of go back and forth? Why don't you, okay. you know, tell me what maybe on the top of your list of general superstitions might be the one that you don't believe in the most. Is there one of those, like one of them that you well, think? Well, uh, no, I, uh, <laughs> as I say, I'm not superstitious at all. Right. So I don't believe in any of these that I have uh, on my list here. But my list is, it's the more popular Okay. superstitions that are out there today right and uh these are in no particular order <laughs> but um just randomly the the one that i put up at the top of the list mm -hmm. is the number 13. ah yes okay. and i don't know what it is about the number 13 but you've got 
you know, the fear of Friday the 13th. And I'm not talking about the guy in the hockey mask with the chainsaw. <laughs> Although the movie was made because Going around this. hacking up uh, virgin girls at a summer camp. <laughs> um, you've, you've got, like, for example, uh, apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, obviously, if you stand out on the street and you look up and you count the floors, obviously, there is a 13th floor. Right. But if you go in that building and take the elevator up, there is no button number 13. It skips from 12 to 14, even though the 13th floor is a physical reality. True enough. And, you know, it's funny, too, that I've noticed that... Um, the thir 13 is a historical, the superstition around that is based on the Templar, the Knights Templar, because it was October the 13th that the two high grand masters were put to death. And so this is where this stems from, at least according to some historical sources. So that could be that it's just sort of continued through being that they were Christian that perhaps that has carried through in the Christian belief system that these, you know, these two grandmasters of the Knights Templar were put to death on that date, and therefore it is a bad day. Now, it was obviously a bad day for them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, maybe you know, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> just a little bit. But at the end of the day, it does seem to really have stemmed many more centuries, you know, continuing from that time period. There's another instance, too, and, and you may or may not know this, and it's the number four. The number four also gets excluded in apartment buildings or condominiums, depending on where they're built. So in Toronto, particularly around the Scarborough age, Asian uh, community areas of Markham and, and Asian Court, etc., if you go in the buildings where there is a lot of Chinese, there is no number four or number oh, three. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. Yes. So in my my ex-in-law's building, they have no number four because that sounds like the word death in Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. So they don't want to have to say oh. that number because it sounds like the word that they use for death. So that too is also omitted from, so you've got this, you know, number four missing and number 13 in some cases in some buildings, especially in China, you don't get number four or number 13. So interesting that those things have come from that. And we can see that, you know, the word death, maybe you don't want to live on the death floor. <laughs> right you don't want to live on the floor that sounds you know that's that sounds like the word death uh i can see that as a potential superstition or belief or fear so that one does make sense i guess the friday the 13th and then there's the is it trichodecophobia i believe is the other fear of that the, that is what is known as could make sense if you were Christian and or, you know, had a, had any Templar in your family somewhere. Um, I find I find those kinds of things interesting that they carry through and continue to, you know, be prevalent even today. Right. And and so let's look at one from the theater, the term break a leg. You've right. heard that, I'm sure, right? Yep. Break a leg. Yep, yep. we've this, all heard that. Yes, this kind of has a number of sort of different sources, depending on who you <laughs> who you believe. But you know, when you're in the theater and you're backstage or you're, you know, any of the crew, you never wish actors good luck. On their performance right or you don't say good luck in general to anybody who's working on a production and instead we use the term break a leg and it's sort of interesting because in france they tend to use the term merde <laughs> which translates to shit um and it came mostly from dancers obviously but it doesn't actually refer to 
the actor breaking their leg, but it, it does prefer, it's, it sort of means backstage, the masking or the curtains, the theatrical curtains mm -hmm. um, that cover the back of the stage. So when you say breaking a leg, it sort of means you've crossed from backstage into the play area, right? So you've come out into the forefront onto the stage and you're entering in the spotlight. Now, it seems a little crazy. You think, well, what in the world has that got to do with a superstition? Like, why would you think that? But it goes back to the early days of theater when the rigging crew were sailors. So they actually were sailors. The rigging of theatrical um, flies, backdrops, curtains, they were generally handled by sailors who were on shore. And that's because that rigging is very similar to sail rigging. So breaking a leg or, you know, the curtain falling could conceivably kill someone. And so that was a very serious thing in theater. So instead of literally saying good luck, we get this term break a leg. I mean, there could be other meanings to that as well, but that's the one I'm most familiar with. I'm most familiar with going back to that time in early theater where sailors were brought in to handle the rigging of the stage, the light, you know, the curtains. This is pre-lighting or any of those kinds of things, right? We're talking about, you know, candlelight at the at the front of the stage and and curtains being hung and then flying scenery in and out behind you as the actors were performing so this was a very you know sort of scary treacherous thing that could happen right you're up there you're up high you're working with all of these ropes and these you know heavy pieces of uh canvas that have been painted you're moving them in and out on stage and hence you know these things could happen. I've also heard that break a leg had something to do with an actor at some point very early on, perhaps in the 1800s, that had actually slipped and fallen on stage and had hurt themselves. So wherever it comes from, it's still out there. It's still used all the time when we, yes, it is. You know, yeah. when we get backstage or on stage, we're, we're always saying break a leg. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an interesting one too, right? Whether you believe yeah. or disbelieve. And it's funny, right? Because even myself, like I say, I'm not superstitious, but I will still say that to fellow actors or people in you know my cast and crew, because it's just something that we have become accustomed to. Right. Whether we believe it or not. So I find that one really interesting. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's it, it's very interesting. So what's another one that you've got on your list there? Okay, next on the list is breaking a mirror. And the okay, superstition yes. is, is if you break a mirror, you're going to get seven years of bad luck. Now, I just consider that being clumsy if you end up breaking a mirror. But um, I have no idea where this particular superstition came from as to you will acquire seven years of bad luck if you bust that mirror. Right. Well, here's something interesting about that too that I find is rooted in history once again. We have the, going way back, thousands of years, we have the story of Medusa. Right? And Medusa, you know, when you looked into the eyes of Medusa, she could turn you to stone. And the other part of that, you know, sort of story was in order to turn Medusa into stone, she had to look at her own reflection. Right. And right. so there's this whole idea of, you know, that something bad is going to happen if, you know, that mirror breaks. I think could stem from that sort of old story of Medusa, because if you broke the mirror, Medusa was able to enchant you and turn you to stone. She wasn't able to see her own reflection and therefore you were sort of done for, right? I mean, there's that aspect of it. The other part of it is too, I think is that in earlier times and, and various cultures, um, 
gazing upon one reflection was considered to be, you know, something that was almost otherworldly. You know, it, it was almost like the very maybe the first person who ever saw the reflection in water. It probably scared them because they did not really understand the concept of that. And so by looking into the water and seeing essentially a face looking back at you, maybe you didn't realize that was your own face, right? So we have all these like sort of interesting yeah. little things that go, but the breaking of the mirror, you know, the shattering of one's image, the shattering of the, you know, potential or possibilities, I think is something that's tied to that. I, I don't really follow... You know, and the Victorians had a, obviously had that, you know, <laughs> belief of covering mirrors when someone passed because they didn't want their, well, that's right. yeah. their soul yeah. to leave, you know, mirror is a portal. And so therefore, perhaps, you know, breaking a mirror is bad luck because you've trapped spirits in this world as well by breaking that mirror. So I think there's a lot of different approaches to that one and I'm sure it varies from cultures and different locations in the world whether people believe it or don't believe it I have never really believed in the broken mirror theory or you know, superstition yeah well but, as I say it, as I say it's you know you break a mirror you're just being clumsy <laughs> well yeah or it's that totally accidental right but yeah. <laughs> At the end of the day, I don't know. I don't think that, you know, you're going to have seven years of bad luck because you've broken a mirror. But it's amazing how many people will, you know, will and do believe that. So, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and I, I don't condemn anybody for believing in superstitions. Again, we've been raised on them from the beginning of time. It's just a matter of whether or not they have perhaps happened and then something coincidentally coincides with that. And then again, right. you are, right. you know, very much stuck in the concept of that superstition playing out, but interesting. So let me talk about another theatrical one, because this one I'm sure is another one that most people are familiar with. When you are on stage or in a theater and you are performing, Macbeth, you never ever say the name of the play. We refer to it as the Scottish play. We don't call it Macbeth in the theater. What do you think of that one? I was not aware of that. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's a pretty common one in theater as well. And that one really stems to a very early period where there was a performance of Macbeth happening and one of the actors, the original actor who actually played the character of Macbeth died tragically during the performance. Oh. And so the show has essentially been said to be cursed ever since. So this is why we don't say it. Now, if we do happen to utter, <laughs> you know, the name and not the Scottish play, there's sort of a series of counter curses that you have to follow in order to undo the damage that you've done by saying the name. And generally it's reciting a line from the play that's considered lucky, which is Two Gentlemen of Verona. Another one will tell you there is a, you know, sort of the idea of reciting a line from A Midsummer Night's Dream. And there's a very specific line in that, that you would recite. But it's kind of an interesting, again, that it has stayed with us for so long. This idea of, you know, this is going back to Shakespeare's time, right? That this actor died on stage during the performance. Right. So we're talking some, you know, 600 years now that this superstition has followed this, this play. And I myself have done the Scottish play more, more than once. And generally, we do not call it Macbeth when we are in the theater. If you're outside of the theatrical space, it doesn't seem to apply. But it's once you're inside 
on stage or in the theater in general. It's a big no-no. And I can see why, you know, if, if the original actor died, perhaps you don't want to follow that up with another, you know, another uh, death on stage. But yeah, yeah. But, but again, you know, stemming from a fear, right? So the superstition stems from a fear and the fear being death, <laughs> which is sort of what Macbeth's about anyway. <laughs> but you know interesting interesting um you know the there's the whole incantation by the witches and all of the things that go with it because that's another one if you are said to speak the incantation incantation of the witches from the scene outside of the actual play itself that's also considered bad luck so it could be a superstition so we have a few things tied to to that particular production itself and I don't know if this story carries to another country let's say they were performing the play you know somewhere in I don't know Asia somewhere do they actually you know not say the name of the play I'll actually have to ask my son in China I'm gonna ask his wife to see if she might know anything about that because I'm curious yeah. or is it just sort of that UK, North America, you know, maybe European, perhaps sort of Western European belief, or does it actually follow the play wherever it goes? Mm -hmm. That um, that brings me to something else on my list. And this goes back to uh, one of our old shows that we did. Okay. That involves iron. And that show and this superstition is... Witches gates. Oh yes, yeah. And we have both visited the uh, the cemetery that is somewhat local to us. In, in yes, that's right. Along the north, um, I, I honestly forget what the name of the cemetery is at the moment, off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, and they have a witch's gate. Yes, which is really neat to see. I mean, they're they're more common in the UK. We see quite a lot of them still in the UK. But clearly that superstition was brought over to where we are in southern Ontario by people from the UK early on. And we see these witches gates being erected at the entrance of cemeteries. Right? So what's your concept of that? Why, why do you think they, they put witches gates out front of a cemetery? Well, it's... Um... I guess it goes back to, you know, the superstition of of believing that these gates would would keep witches out of the cemetery or on the other end of the aspect if you had a burial of someone who was claimed to be a witch it would probably keep them contained within the cemetery. Right. And if you see some of the early cemeteries as well, uh, especially here in, in southern Ontario, you, you will see that the majority of them also have at least four corner posts at each side, each corner of the cemetery that are iron as well, cast iron. And then they would either have a cast iron fence that ran around the perimeter, or they would have, you know, a wooden fence that was attached to these. So we have that interesting, you know, grounding slash, you know, idea of um, containing or, you know, keeping something out or in. And in the case... Well, there's, there's other instances, um, and I actually know of one here in Hamilton, that the, there's a, a, there could be graves that are completely covered over with an iron grate. Right, yes. And, um, you know, there are those who are superstitious that say, oh, well, it's, you know, it's to stop the body from rising up and becoming a vampire at night. Right. And, well, no, obviously not. No. But in reality, it was there um, to prevent um, grave robbing. Exactly. I mean, you know, like our, our, our old friends, Burke and Hare. <laughs> <laughs> I love Burke and Hare. They're like... <laughs> You know, the, they're just the epitome of everything that 
you know, that that era was about in the beginning of, you know, medical science and, and yes, okay, they murdered people. <laughs> and they sold their bodies for medical practice, you know, for science and, and that, but it's just such a macabre story. And it shows you that, you know, how desperation in, you know, periods of time with people who are very poor, that, you know, some of the lengths they would go to, to, you know, provide a means for themselves, but. Yeah, it, but it makes me laugh at, you know, some of these people out there that, that actually think, you know, the corpse is going to rise out of the grave and, and walk around under the full moon. It's, um, the rep- it's like the, it's like the old story of, um, garlic repelling vampires. Yes. It's, well. um, yeah. I think the only thing garlic <laughs> repels is your fellow human. <laughs> but it, it works. It actually works. Because, you know, I like garlic and it's very heart healthy and, and good for your health. And I, I've got no vampires here. Oh, no, there you go. It actually works. <laughs> so, you know, garlic and, and, and cast iron. There we go. We're, we're the safe from, from the, the vampires and the revenants. They will not be walking, you know, entering our homes. But it, it's interesting, right? Because again, so many of these superstitions stem from fear and beliefs. And as I say, a lot of these superstitions are rooted in, in belief systems like Christianity. And so it again is that juxtaposition between, you know, maybe trying to stop people from doing something bad like grave robbing. So we have these, you know, these witches gates, but also perhaps it's more to make people feel safe that a witch, you know, and and that's the funny thing too, though, did they, you know, from my understanding, witches weren't really buried in hollow ground anyways, they they would have buried them, you know, outside of the cemetery. So it, it mm-hmm. does feel like that is to keep that spirit of the witch out or, you know, maybe other fellow witches who may have shown up to more. Yeah, well, there's, um, there's a cemetery here um, in the Hamilton area. Um, it's um, in a a location that used to be called Albion Mills. Oh yes, I know it. Yeah. And, and yeah, okay. And there is a there's a a cemetery there. Um it's got a whole brand new subdivision um built up around it now because obviously that's a well developed area mm-hmm. compared to back in the 1800s when it was just a milling town. That's right. And um there there's an individual that's buried in that cemetery. His name was Robert Van Dusen, and he was claimed to have been a warlock. Oh, interesting. And his grave is buried off to the side of this cemetery. He is not within the cemetery boundaries. He's got his own little individual plot, and it also has an iron fence. Around it. Completely surrounding his grave site. Yeah. I remember some years ago when we lived in Hamilton, we did discover that. And I thought it was a rather interesting, you know, note of, again, the superstitions around people who didn't understand other people. (laughs) Right. You know, it's like we're going to apply these labels to people. And I, I don't know that he applied that label to himself. He might have been, you know, somebody who didn't believe in Christianity, perhaps at the time, or was perhaps uh, another, you know, another sect of Christianity that the local people didn't agree with. I mean, there's so many different little nuances that, you know, could explain these things. But it is interesting that we see this even here in southern Ontario. This is not limited to just the UK or Europe or places where we, you know, we hear a lot of stories like that. But we do see those superstitions being brought over and being applied even here in, you know, sort of earlier settler times that, you know, people were, were still hanging on to those, those, yeah. books, right. And it's, it's, it's a, you know, it is what it is. We are people. We, we go with what we know.
Thank you for watching The Ghost Show Online. Join your hosts again next week as they discuss more tales of the supernatural, the paranormal, and all things spectacular. See you soon. See you soon.